Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to our Monday weekly recap video. Hope your week has started off really nice. Ours has, I'm so excited about this week. Our forecast says it's gonna be in the mid to high 50s. That's why I'm sitting outside right now because even though it looks overcast and gray, it is very nice out and it feels like a total gift. A couple things before we get into the questions from last week's videos. First off, the Garden Answer Gathering, which we've been talking to you about for the last few months. The tickets went on sale this past Saturday and they sold out and they sold out faster than last year, which is so amazing. So I'm really excited about it. To those of you who got tickets, Aaron and myself and the whole planning committee are gonna be working extra hard to make this a really fun event and have lots of really beautiful things for you to see when you come. And to those of you guys who didn't get tickets, I'm so sorry. Um, we're in this kind of weird, we're trying to navigate. Our, our garden is not a public garden. We don't open it up for tours usually, except for this event, um, which was, it went so great last year that we're hoping like just bear with us we may you know like this year we doubled the amount of tickets we may double it again next year or we might decide to do two events maybe one late spring one in the fall i don't know we're just kind of letting this process evolve we're really enjoying it though um so anyway just bear with us on that um the second thing i wanted to talk about was the boise flower and garden show that's in boise idaho which is just 67 miles down the road from us we are tentatively planning on being there so i just wanted to throw it out there i think it's march 27th, which is a Friday through March 29th, which is a Sunday. We we're hoping to be there on Saturday, the 28th of March, doing just a little informal meet and greet at the Far West booth from 1 to 3 p.m. Now, this is all tentative right now. When we have solid information, we will put it on the website and I will be updating you in these Monday videos. So anyway, let's get right into the videos. The first one was how I water in winter. And in that video, I just described the process my process i showed you the process of how i water things in the winter and the importance of it so real quick the goal of watering in the winter is just to make sure that the root balls of our perennials or evergreens that we have in containers don't dry out because sometimes we have a really dry windy windy winter ours are always different um, and so we have our our planters usually on an every 10 to 14 day schedule of watering um, so i'm such a visual person that i was hoping that by showing you guys how exactly I water that it was helpful. Uh, Princess Julia said, I see you still have your cushions on your garden furniture. Do they not fade in the snow? Um, so most of our garden furniture is either undercover, like I think the chairs that you saw in that video are under our patio, like our awning our house somehow, our porch. Anyway, so those don't get any direct weather on them or any direct sun. Um, and the rest of our furniture is covered. Um, so we've got these nice covers we got from Plow and Hearth that go over a lot of our furniture outside and it protects it. Shelly said, do you do pretty much the same route each time or do you ever switch up the order? It depends on what the weather's been like. And I know my containers well enough now that I don't really have to check the soil on all of them. I know that the open containers that have tulips in them, they're receiving a lot more moisture than the containers that have evergreens that's deflecting a lot of the moisture. So I know those evergreen containers typically need it more often than the open ones, if that makes sense. So if I go out and I know it's been kind of rainy or whatever, I'll usually skip the bulb containers and just do the evergreen containers. And you get to know your stuff after a certain amount of time and what route you need to take which is different every time. Jennifer says, so I see your water source is still unfrozen. I'm in Salt Lake City and all my water sources from the house are sheltered from frost with those foam covers from Home Depot. What is enabling your water source to flow during winter temperatures? My hoses are all frozen. So not all of our hoses work during the winter. We have three frost-free uh, faucets. I'm looking at one right now. And what that means is the water source has been buried at least 48 inches under the ground so it doesn't freeze. But all of our other like surface level faucets, like the one in my garden, I can't use because that's just coming off of um, like PVC that's not very deep. Um, so all of those have been blown out, but the three frost freeze, I have one here kind of by our back kitchen door. I've got another one on the west side of our house and one out by the greenhouse. Um, and that makes it uh, easier, I guess, in the winter because I don't have to go in the house to get water. Uh, Jane says, do you have plans to get rid of the kidney shaped grass in the front? So in the Versailles garden, there are two kidney bean shaped pieces of grass and for now they're gonna stay, uh, but we do plan on doing something completely different in that space, but it's just been kind of like bumping down the priority list because other things have kind of taken the place like, you know, having to put in a new furnace and, and um, things like that. They kind of take over the budget for projects like that. Um, so we don't plan on keeping them because they are hard to water. Our water system up there is probably the hardest of their, our entire property to keep that grass looking nice. So we have to supplement in the summer. We go take a hose out and put a hose on the grass and pull it a couple times during the day so that it stays nice and that's a 
huge pain, but we do have plans to change that entire space. Like everything's gonna go in, that's in the center and we're gonna do something different. Uh, Jan said, how many trips do you have to make to the water faucet to, to do that many pots? So you saw that I've had four buckets and two watering cans. It took all of that, plus I had to fill one of the five gallon buckets and the blue watering can one more time and that's it. It's really not that much. Uh, Emma said, why are your lights on outside in the daytime? And I, <laughs> we've had that question quite often. Our carriage lights around our house are always on. We use LED bulbs. We've only, have we had to replace the bulbs one time in four years? From incandescent from, to LED. Oh, so we've only replaced what was there. Yeah. So what was in there when we moved in was incandescent and Aaron changed them to LED and we haven't had to change the bulbs since and they're on 24 seven. I like the look of it. I like that they're on when it starts to get dusk. I don't have to run around the house and turn on switches and things. Um, I don't know. I just like the way it looks. Uh, Teresa said, I have boxes planted in urn type cement containers and when I water them, they float. I'm not sure why they do that, but is it bad for them? Do I need to do something that so that it doesn't happen? Yeah, first thing I would check is your drainage in your containers. Uh, if the drainage isn't like fast enough, um, it, you know, the water can collect and make your plants float. And the only other reason why I think that would happen is if your evergreens are severely root bound and holding like all the soil in one big, you know, root ball. Um, and that way the water gets in there and makes the whole thing float and the water doesn't drain fast enough. So I don't know, those are the two things I would check. The next video was the DIY house plant hanger. And in that video, I just showed you how to make a super easy um, house plant hanger <laughs> for inside your house that's completely moldable to whatever kind of container you have, like whatever size, you can still use your saucers so the plants are easier to water. And I really like the way they turned out, the, the way they look, very simple and clean, but they're still pretty. M says, I love this project and hope to copy it soon. Question, what brand of shears are you using? They look pos like possibly Fiskars. Um, and I believe that they were Fiskars. We'll link them down below. Uh, Rachel says, can you suggest a good hanging plant for a bedroom? Happy, colorful, room brightening. The person in this room needs a pick me up and the room needs it too. You know what, there are a ton of good hanging house plants out there. Um, it depends on your light situation, but Hoyas are awesome and you can get some that have really pretty leaf variegation. Tratoscanchas are beautiful. Um, let's see, there's a house plant, a goldfish plant, and I cannot think of the the name of it other than goldfish plant but I have one in my bedroom and they have these little dark green waxy leaves and then they get orange blooms on them all the time that look just like goldfish and that's a really fun one but uh, I would suggest watching some of Plantarina's videos because she does a ton with hanging house plants and she'll have some really good videos I'm sure about that. Charles says where to buy those curtain tiebacks I've looked online but nowhere to be found that thick any recommendations where to find those I got mine at Joann's. Uh, Twinkle says, could you please spell that plant name for me? So Hoya is H-O-Y-A, and I think this one's a Hoya Exotica. I looked on Plantarina's website because that's who sent it to me, um, and that's one of the varieties that looks closest to the one I have. Um, so anyway, very pretty plant. Kim says, how could anyone give this project a thumbs down? It's cute, easy, and a great video. Thank you. I don't know why people give gardening videos a thumbs down. Seems like a pretty benign subject to me. S says, where could I find a hanging plant stand like the one you're using? And a lot of you guys asked that. I picked that up at my parents' garden center and I will do my best to find what brand that was. It's just one you can toss anywhere. It's got kind of legs on it and then two pieces of metal that come up and then gather at the top and then you can hang your hanging plant from that. And it is very handy to have. So I will try to find that. We'll link it down below if I do and then pop the name of it up on the screen for you. And Becky says, what jeans brand do you wear? American Eagle, always. Angel said, what is that stain color? It is a Minwax stain, wood stain in the color Early American. Shwita asked, do you ever end up killing a plant? Yes. <laughs> and most of the time it's due to um, neglect. Um, sometimes out here in the landscape, like we'll do a video on a plant and I'll plant it and then I'll think, okay, later I'm gonna go put a emitter on it. I need to go hook it up onto our drip system and then I'll completely forget about it because we have a lot going on around here. And then a week later I'll think, oh, I forgot to hook it up on drip and I'll go look at it and it's like in the middle of summer and it's completely fried. <laughs> so it happens, it happens to everybody. Uh, Gemma said, would the rope need to be glued a bit to prevent the knot from slipping? So those knots are really tough. Like I know it looks like, well, you just knotted the rope and they'll just slip out of that. But I couldn't, like I pulled hard on those knots and there was no slippage that I could see, but you could definitely stick some glue up in there. I mean, just a hot glue gun and just pop some glue inside that knot just to add a little bit of extra stability. Wouldn't hurt anything. Uh, Dark Lord, ooh, Dark Lord. 
says, I realize you probably won't read this. We do try to read all of the comments in our comment section, um, but do you know what model that miter saw is? Or you can ask your husband. I've been looking for one that, um, that one looks like one I might want to buy. So it is a DeWalt um, miter saw battery operated. It does 12 inches, right? 12 inch boards. It like pulls and then it has a stand. It has a stand. <laughs> Aaron knows about as much about it as I do, so we will find the model online and link it down below. Dark Lord, I want to know what you're doing with the saw. <laughs> uh, next video was new perennials for 2020, and in that video I talked about nine new perennials that are coming on the market this year that are really exciting. Um, Big Eyed Fish says, can you please explain how you're creating a cottage garden vibe by your chicken coop versus your other gardens and what style those are considered? So I don't know. I don't know what style you can call my gardens. I've got a lot of formal touches in our garden, um, but I do like to back a lot of that formality with the cottage garden vibe, which is like this overflowing, abundant uh, garden, you know, where plant, you don't see between plants. It's just kind of a jumble of color and blooms. I love that look. And around the chicken coop, I wanted it just to look a little bit more like no boxwood hedges. I didn't want anything like really formal. I just wanted it to look very free out there, if that makes sense. Gail said, could you please tell me the difference between Brunnera and Coleus? Sure. So Brunnera is a perennial, termed a perennial, especially in my area. They come back year after year and you cut them back to the ground every year and they come back fresh. Coleus is an annual in my area. You can treat them as a house plant and bring them in, um, but they're both grown for their leaves. They both have very unique, colorful leaves, um, both very pretty plants. Also, Brunnera prefers a little bit more of a protected spot from the sun in the afternoon, particularly, and Coleus, especially the Color Blaze series, can take either sun or shade. Uh, Abigail says, I'm so excited to plant my first real garden this spring. How do you know your soil's pH level? Is there a website I can rely on? No not that I know of. For regional data, it's so different. It's wildly different even in my own garden. Um, or would it be better to test the soil on my property? What's the range? What range is considered normal? What do you consider very low or very high? Um, so what I would do, you can take a soil sample to your local extension office and they will send it off and get you a very detailed um, list of all of the different nutrients in your soil, what the pH is, and that's a really good way to go if you want very exact information. You can also buy inexpensive pH kits at your local garden center. Some of them will have digital readouts. Some of them are like you put the little pill in the water with some soil and it'll turn a certain color depending on your soil pH and that'll at least get you within the realm of where your soil pH is. It's very easy and inexpensive so I'd recommend that you just start there with an inexpensive kit and that way you can usually do several pH tests with one kit and you can go to different areas of your garden and just see if you're kind of within the same pH or if you're dealing with slightly different um, levels in different areas. Uh, next one is I'm in the PDX area and love Empress Hostas but can't seem to conquer the snails. I always end up with damaged leaves and they don't look good after a week or two. What do you find that, uh, the best strategies to be? So I use Bonide's Bug and Slug Killer. It's a bait that you can put around your hostas. I don't deal with snails as much as I deal with slugs. And even then we're a lot drier than you are over there on the other side of the state. Um, so it's something that you just might have to apply more liberally and more often but it does work really well for us with the amount of slugs we do get here. Uh, Melissa says, I have a gazebo that I'd like to plant a climbing rose on each side to climb up the sides and along the top. What would be the best rose that blooms the longest? I thought about the iceberg climbing rose after seeing the one at your parents' garden. Do they do good or do you know of a better one? Icebergs are awesome roses, especially if you want a white one. They're so beautiful. I actually have a whole bunch of icebergs and they are climbers. They're not climbing on anything. I have to keep them like continually cut down um, and they're kind of behind our fireplace, but they bloom for so much of the summer. They're just a beautiful one. If you want a different colored rose, there's a lot of different really, really awesome ones. Like I planted a David Austin called the Generous Gardener on our front arbor and it's got these really soft pink creamy white kind of blooms, really beautiful full cupped blooms. I planted Zephyrine Druins on our chicken coop. So it's the white run and they're bright pink roses, but it's a nearly thornless rose and they grow really fast and really big and um, really pretty flowers. And then I've got climbing Colettes on our garden arbors, which are really beautiful, full cupped, fragrant, pink roses that I really like. I, there's so many beautiful varieties out there, but icebergs are awesome. Uh, Bateman said, how are these new? So they're not new plants per se, they're just improvements on older varieties. So they'll improve things like the length of bloom time or how often they'll bloom or the color of the blooms, maybe it's a new color. Um, they'll also improve things like disease resistance, mildew resistance, heat tolerance, all of those sorts of things. 
Kim said, I noticed you mentioned some of the plants being resistant to rabbits, a problem I'm sure I will have in my flower beds I'm currently designing. Is this information listed separately on plant tags or if it's deer resistant, can I assume it's rabbit resistant as well? No, it needs to say rabbit resistant to be rabbit resistant. Just because it's deer resistant doesn't mean the rabbits won't try it. Uh, Connie said, I know you were talking about perennials now, but was wondering if you plant dahlias. Yes, I do. And I've only planted just a handful of dahlias every single year in my garden. Like uh, I would say last year I planted, I don't know, like maybe 30 ish dahlias, maybe 40. This year I'm planting a ton of dahlias and we're going to do a whole dahlia series. So it'll be really fun. Uh, Drew said, I love all the varieties of Veronica available. However, I also love the look of salvia that you grew last year. Can you explain the differences of the two and why I would want to choose one over the other? So salvia and Veronica have similar bloom structures in that they bloom in kind of a spiky form, but salvia blooms are typically bigger and a little bit more open. The shape of their flowers actually are, uh, easier for pollinators to land on, like they're kind of lipped out. And Veronica have tighter blooms, um, a little bit more spiky looking blooms just because they're tighter and they mature from the bottom up. So you'll notice on Veronica blooms, like the bottom will be very, very saturated in color while the tops are still green because those buds are just maturing slowly from bottom to top. Their leaves and their branching habits also can kind of indicate the difference. So salvia is actually part of the mint family and they have square stems. And that's a very easy way to like test whether it's a salvia or veronica just take a feel of the stem if it's round it's veronica if it's square it's a salvia um, and also like veronica and salvia have a very different smell so salvia is a very distinctive smell once you smell it like that's a salvia it's easy to tell um, veronica does not have that smell and i think the leaves look a little bit different so salvias tend to be a little bit more like a little whiter and veronicas tend to be a little bit more slender uh, linda said could you do a video on the best kinds of annuals and perennials to grow on the north side of the house and also in heavy shade under large old maple trees. I think that sounds like a really good idea. In fact, Erin and I were just talking about this because you guys seem to really like the annual video and this perennial video. And we do have a shrub video hopefully coming out this week talking about some new shrubs. But if you want to see more stuff like that, just like diving in a little bit deeper onto specific plants and giving you guys a handful of ideas for a certain situation, like plants that perform really well for me in full sun or in bad soil or in drought kind of areas like xeriscape kind of stuff. If you want to see that, let me know and then give me some ideas on what types of things you want to know about, like for shady locations like Linda wants to know and so on. Uh, Rary says, hi, I'm interested in getting a couple of Summerific Candy Crush hibiscus this year. I saw it on a video you did last year and haven't forgotten it. My question is, do you cut it all the way down to the ground in the winter? Um, so you can cut it back in the fall or you can cut it back in the spring. Um, I cut mine back in the backyard to about six inches this last fall. You just want to make sure not to cut it all the way down. Um, that way, if you have any water or something or a freeze or any damage that happens in that um, that branch that you leave, it's not really close to the crown of the plant. And it's one of those type of plants that takes forever to come out of its dormancy in spring and you'll think it's dead. You just need to be patient with this type of plant because it just takes them a while to to come alive. Uh, Carol said, I love when you do these reviews. Glad to know they're improving Veronica's. So many get mildew. Does the Allium serendipity keep its foliage through the season? Yes, it does. And that's one of the things I love about that serendipity Allium, because once it's done blooming, I can deadhead the spent flowers and I'm left with this nice little mound grassy looking plant. So it looks like an ornamental grass out in the flower bed instead of a perennial that you cut all the way back and you, you know, don't really see its leaves for, you know, several weeks out of your season. It's just a pretty plant all the way through the growing season. Emma said, can you let us know how opening act stacks up to the other tall flocks in terms of powdery mildew resistance? Um, and yes, we can definitely, we talked about the ultra pink in this video. I have planted the opening act white and the opening act blush in my garden, but I just planted them last year. They did great, no mildew in our garden last year, but I'll let you know throughout this next few seasons how they do and what I find with them. Now we do live in a pretty dry climate, so we don't typically deal with a ton of mildew issues, but I'll definitely give you updates. Uh, Sheena said, you mentioned ladybug larva on the plants. I was wondering what they, the larva looks like. We'll put one on the screen for you. Tammy says, I have a question about the yarrow. I have a terrible time with my yarrow self-seeding and the seedlings are not true to the mother plant. Um, do these yarrow self-seed? No, they do not. They stay contained which makes them awesome. Uh, DH says, a uh, question regarding hellebores. I noticed in the spring that mine are covered in bugs, aphids, little mites. Is there something I can do about that? Should I plant something next to it that attracts ladybugs, which will then eat whatever's on the hellebores? So I think that question came from, I was talking about the Veronica and how it was a host plant to hundreds and hundreds of ladybugs and ladybug larvae. 
for hellebores that have bugs really early in the season, personally, I would probably spray them because it's probably early enough. You're not seeing a lot of activity from a lot of pollinators and things. So I would use something organic like your Rose RX or your Midex, something gentle, just spray right on the hellebores, get rid of the bugs. You can also do a ho use a hose to knock off most of the aphids too. You can try that method first. So spray them with a hose. If you know you still see aphids around, you can spray them with something organic. Other otherwise, definitely, you know, if you want to use a biological approach and do ladybugs, you can buy ladybugs. Um, usually, your local garden center will carry bags of them. I know ours does. They're like 1,500 ladybugs in a in a bag, and I usually bring home two or three bags every single year and release them in my garden, and they will stay as long as there is a food source present. Um, as far as like planting a host plant near them, that's a great idea. Although hellebores typically typically want more shade. Veronica wants more sun. So you would need to find something and I can't think of anything off the top of my head. You would need to find something that's more shade tolerant. That's also a host to ladybugs. I need to research that. Uh, Juanita said, what's the main difference between the serendipity and the millennium allium? So I got this information off the Walters Garden website, which is where we got our serendipity alliums. Um, and they said the word serendipity means an unexpected occurrence and what a fitting name for this sport of the popular millennium. The sport shares all the qualities that made Millennium great, but with the attractive blue foliage. So it still has the globe-like rosy purple flowers that match the parent and are produced profusely in mid to late summer. So it looks like to me, the only difference is that serendipity has uh, bluer colored leaves. The next video was called the ultimate lawn tractor attachment question uh, mark. So in that video, a big tool rack sent out their yard rack for us to try on the back of our John Deere lawn tractor. And so we put it together for you guys on the video and then kind of went through pros and cons of it and then tried it out in the garden. Uh, it was a fun one to do. Uh, Julie said, what brand of coat do you wear? So I was wearing a black coat, I think in that video and I got that one at Eddie Bauer. Uh, Sari Kay said, have you ever thought about investing in a gator or a golf cart for your property? Yes, actually Aaron and I have been talking talking all about all kinds of different equipment. Like what do we need? Do we need a tractor or a forklift? We could use a forklift on many different occasions. A golf cart would be nice. I typically use the lawn tractor or I just manually pull one of our gorilla carts around. So I don't know. That's one of those things too that like I would rather pay to have a new brick pathway put in than buy a golf cart. <laughs> I don't know, priorities. Nancy said, how do you clean the bottom of that attachment out? I'm sure debris falls in there. I'd be afraid one of those tools would fall and hit someone in the head. Uh, as far as the tools falling, I don't think that there's any opportunity for them to fall. They're in there really securely. I know it looks like, I mean, you see these shovels just kind of hanging out um, and it looks like they could fall, but they won't fall. Uh, as far as cleaning the bottom of the attachment out, I'm not sure. I mean, I must, I'm assuming debris gets in there. Um, you could probably use a blower to blow most of it out. And I'm assuming you could use a shot back or you could take it off and just dump it out. I don't know. We haven't had it long enough to know. Hello Condo says, curious, why do you not mulch your grass? And that was an incredibly popular question on that video. And the reason we don't is mainly because it has the potential to be kind of messy um, in two ways. One, it can look messy. And two, I don't want to walk through grass and have a bunch of stuff stuck to my feet or on my knees where I'm constantly down working, you know, on the edge of flower beds. I also don't want Benjamin playing in a, in a mess. Um, and I think that could have to do with a couple of things. One, sometimes we have an erratic mowing schedule and we're not getting to it as often as we would like and even in if we are consistent in the growing season when we're mowing twice a week we mow I mean we have to cut a lot of grass it grows so fast um, and we're very dry like we don't get rain during the spring and summer very often or the late spring I should say in summer very often um, so it doesn't actually decompose as fast as it might in an area where you get more rain um, so that's pretty much the reason why we don't. CHTV Maddock says, I'm interested in purchasing a little wagon like yours. Who makes it? So that was a gorilla cart. Okay, so the last video was making my favorite dessert with the lemons I grew and planting the lemon seeds. And I have to be completely honest with you guys, I almost didn't want to put that video up because I made so many mistakes in the kitchen, like the lighting was bad because I set the light up and it was too bright. And then I dropped the camera, I let the camera lens fog up, I can't remember what else I did. But by the end I was like, Erin, I don't know about this. Like it was just a hot mess. And I mean, the dessert was good in the end, uh, but you guys seem to like it, which made me really, really happy. I guess it was relatable if nothing else, because I think that that's usually how it goes in the kitchen for a lot of us. So the first question was a common one and it was about those individual copper 
pour over funnels that you can set on top of your coffee cup and you put a little filter in there and your coffee grounds and then you pour hot water over it and makes a beautiful cup of coffee. I bought those at World Market. We will link them down below and I will have you know that I think they're only like $13 now. I bought them when they were $25 a piece and I bought five and it was like the biggest splurge ever. And I sat there in the store thinking, am I gonna use these enough? Like, should I buy these? And I'm so glad I did. Rebecca said, what are all those houseplants in your kitchen windowsill? Um, could we have a houseplant tour? And that's something that we need to do here sometime soon. Our houseplants are all looking pretty good right now. On my kitchen windowsill, it's just like a mish mishmash of stuff. I have an orchid, an ivy, uh, aloe. Now I've got the Hoya hanging. I've got um, some hyacinths planted up there now. It's just kind of a constant shuffle and it's kind of the plants where I move them off of a different, out of a different display and I don't really know where to put them. So they just get kind of put on the kitchen windowsill. Um, Ashley said, since you are good at incorporating your homegrown produce into your dishes, even the winter, I had a question for you about winter composting. Do you compost your food scraps in the winter? I don't compost them per se, but we have chickens now and that's where the bulk of our food scraps go. Carolina said, I'm the same way about lemon and food. A good pucker is great. I'll need to try this recipe. Is there an alternative to the torch? So I did read somebody commented that you can put your creme brulees under the broil um, setting on your oven for like two minutes, but you have to watch them really closely. I've never personally tried that, but it seems like that would work if you don't have a torch. Um, next was, I actually love your cooking baking content. Thank you. <laughs> Making me feel better about it. Uh, would you consider doing some with recipes for the things you grow in your garden? Yes, absolutely. If that's something you guys like just every once in a while, us tossing a cooking video in just from something I'm doing anyway, like we would be more than happy to do that. So let me know what you guys think about that. Uh, Sarah said to have homegrown lemons and then fresh eggs. Have you noticed a de decrease in egg production from your girls since it's winter? No, they're still all laying. We get lots of eggs every single day, which is awesome. And I don't know if it's because, I don't know, they seem to like their life out there. So I'm happy about that. And the last question was from John. Laura, do you need to send us an oven mitt to Andrews for you to pick up? So I took the hot, ramekins out of the pan and to place them on a cooling rack with just a towel over my hand and the reason i did that i do have oven mitts but they're too clunky i couldn't like i tried before to get them out and i just like it's kind of like with gardening gloves i have to have the thinnest thing possible for me to function and that's it you guys those were a bunch of questions from this last week's videos thank you so much for all the comments and questions that you guys left it's always fun uh, to read through those and learn from you guys and yeah i hope you're all having a really wonderful week and we will see you in the next video bye